Shomrabyog. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the tiny room. Welcome back to On Shomra Bjog. I am the Michael of Michael and Mitchum's podcast. And I am joined by the man who has an alternative four hour long cut of this podcast called The Colopy Cut. It's Benjamin J. Colopy. Yes, I just stretch out the occasional joke, Michael, to last about, oh, I'd say five minutes past its landing date. Um, Very good joke, Ben. Yep, that's it. You got it. You want to hear how long the theme tune takes? You want to hear? Yeah. (gasps) Theme music for the podcast. We don't actually have anything. It was the same as always because I didn't edit it then. But I, I appreciate the effort you put in there in taking a jab at Zacharin Snyder. <laughs> ah, yes. Um, Michael, there's a whole lot to get through this week. So many. <laughs> so much. So, so many. Yes, yes, so many. Uncountable. Yeah, it's, it's mad. Um, so we're going to start, Michael. You've, you've watched a film. Ben, I've watched a film. As you know, Ben, um, welcome back to Michael and Ben's podcast. I've forgotten, Ben. We do a, we do a time loop episode sometimes. We do, um, Michael. Traditionally, I, I confuse you by doing the intro again, but I've forgotten what I have to say when I do that because I wasn't prepped, Ben. I didn't do my prep, Ben. <laughs> didn't, didn't I didn't do my prep because I had to spend four hours watching Jack, Jackarin Snyder's <laughs> The Justice League. Jackarin Plyder's Justice League. Yeah, Ben, I kept checking the settings to make sure it wasn't in plus 25% speed. Anyway, what was I saying? You boss saying, level. Michael, you- <laughs> I've yes. watched Joe Carnahan's Boss Level, Ben, with your favourite actor and mine, Frank Grillo. Frank Grillo, notable, Michael, probably to most of our listeners, for his elevator scene with one Captain America. Yes, he played uh, Crossbones, Ben, or Frank Grillo, I believe, is the character's real name. <laughs> I've forgotten his name. I've forgotten that character's noted, name. Noted Marvel mercenary Frank Fra- Actor Grillo. Frank Grillo, yes. Uh, what is the character's name, Ben? I can't go any further until I remember the character's name. Well, I'm not doing that convention, Michael. So Boss Level takes our good old tried and tested time loop formula. and Brock and Rumlow! A, what is it? Brock Rumlow. That's a terrible name. Um, but, yeah, fair enough. So the... Boss level takes a, a tried and tested, as I said, Michael, time loop convention and uh, gives it a little action sprucing. Somebody looked at it and said, do you know what we need? Yep. Ethnic stereotypes and big explosions in Very a time good. loop narrative. Very good, Ben. So it's, uh, remember, Ben, I don't know if you've ever seen the film Groundhog Day, Ben. I have. Groundhog Day was a romantic comedy based around a time loop mechanic. Such wit. Such yeah, love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such wit and love. Have you ever seen the film Palm Springs, Ben? I have, Michael. Palm Springs was a more modern romantic comedy based such around wit. This. Yes, exactly. Such wit, such acerbicism, such <laughs> yes. uh, cynicism, Ben. The so modern s- romantic comedy. Also, a, a dash more uh, existential philosophy, Michael, on the consequences of actions and morality shaping you as a person. Yes, Ben, but that's normal in romantic comedies these days. <laughs> yes, a standard little bit of schlock is yes. a good heaping dose of why are we all here? Of existential mm-hmm. dread. You can't have a romantic comedy these days without existential dread, except the delightful Emily in Paris. Benjamin, what else was I saying? I've taken a swing at Emily in Paris there because fuck that show. Um, what else was I? What else was I saying, Benjamin? Benjamin, have you ever seen the film Happy Death Day? I have, Michael. So Happy Death Day is a slasher film, a slasher horror film. It is Michael. the idea of a of a Groundhog Day time loop. Do you mm-hmm. see what I'm getting at, Ben? I can see what you're getting at, Michael. And what what boss level is, Ben, or what boss level was advertised as? Oh no! Was the film Crank revolving around uh, time loop mechanics? That's what I took it to be, Michael. I was yeah, hoping yeah. to see Jason Statham with his pants off. Jason Statham with his pants off. Jason Statham doing a sex on a race course. Yes. Um, Jason Statham having to shock himself back to life. It is much less crank than it lets on. It's a lot more of a generic action film than you would think. Oh, does it have much wit, much love? It doesn't have that much wit. Frank Grillo, (laughs) God bless him, Ben. Frank Grillo's 55 and he is ripped as fuck. Have you ever seen a more ripped steroid use, a more ripped 55 year old? Good man, that was a a nice slip there, Michael. (laughs) Sorry, was that, did I Freudian that out there? Sorry, did I accidentally say something? But he is ripped as hell, Ben, but he is not, God bless him, a madly nuanced actor. No. 
he spends not all John his time Berent- getting ripped as hell. <laughs> yeah, he's not John Berenthal. He's not. He's not going to put in a, an epic performance here. So he plays a dad. Okay, and, you know he he's a dad, um, and he's married for some reason to Naomi Watts, who I oh. can only imagine owed someone a favor or yeah, fair. I don't I don't know what she's doing in this, but she's a, a nuclear physicist scientist, Ben. Oh, classic, classic. And she's made a time loop machine. Oh. And she's worried that her evil Jew-hating boss, Mel Gibson, <laughs> is going to... Oh, no, hold on. Her evil... Um, he is kind of compared to Hitler a little bit in this. Okay. I, I don't know how much Mel Gibson is playing on the own stereotype here, but... Um, play to your strengths, Michael. You know, she's worried <laughs> that Mel Gibson is going to kill her, Ben. So going she to kill puts all the her, Jews with the time machine. No, 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 no. just her. Okay. And so she puts her hus- her ex-husband, who's not a great actor, into Frank a Riddle. time loop, exactly, into a time loop and gives him a couple of clues in the hopes that he'll be able to stop Mel Gibson. That's not great, is it, Michael? It's all right. It's fine. It has it, it has some breaks from the traditional um, time loop narrative style. For okay. example, it starts on loop 148 or something oh okay so he's been there a while he's quite jaded by the time it starts and he's like oh I'm sick of this here comes the choppy man and here comes the lady with the gun so it does that but about halfway through Ben it decides to go back to the day before and we're treated Ben and I'm putting up inverted commas we're treated to 40 minutes of not time loop story we're treated to 40 minutes of the most generic dad who was a soldier and got separated from brainy woman and had kid together but didn't he didn't make it work you know and it's like oh god i don't care where's the time loop? where's the action sequences so we were lied to michael no when it is gross action, horrible violence, it is actually pretty amusing. Oh, okay. Well, that's something. But, well, it is something and it isn't something, Ben, because you have seen all of the innovative and ex- exciting action bits in the trailer. Oh, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the problem with it. Well, that's one of the problems with it. The other problem with it, Ben, is it doesn't make sense as a time loop narrative, unfortunately. Okay, tell me why. Tell me sweet little wise. Oh, uh, the the Fleetwood Mac. Yes. Yeah, very good. Um, did you know the the did you know the opening to that song, Ben, is the same opening as the the opening to Midnight Sky by Miley Cyrus? I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going anyway, to go fact check that after this very episode. It's very true. Um, what was I doing? Um, oh, time loop. Not yes. enough time. Not enough time passes for it to make sense. Okay, go on. So, so by loop 147. He has perfected a car chase, kind of, but there's too much randomness in it for it to make sense that he has simply learned it, because we see him okay. do it. We see him do it three times, and each of the three times he does it differently. He doesn't do it in a Bill Murray way, where he kind of walks through the situation knowing what's going to happen. Right. You know, it's kind of he knows what's going on because he's done it 147 times. But it's also kind of he's a cool guy who in a normal action film would be able to do it for the first time anyway. Okay. So that, you know, that kind of defeats the point of the convention. A little bit. Like, there's a sword fighter in it, Ben. Okay. <laughs> uh, and she keeps killing him with a sword. Oh, Classic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And then he decides, I'm going to kill her with a sword because I can't kill her with guns. She keeps killing me. Okay. Now, why he wouldn't just do it a few more times until he knows exactly how she's going to react and then shoot her? Yeah, because surely if you can do it with a car chase, you can do it with a human being wielding a sword trying to cut your head off. Exactly, Ben. You know, but he doesn't. He decides to learn sword fighting from Michelle Yeoh for some reason. Okay, so she's in the movie too. She also owes someone a favour, as, as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah, because so, those are those yeah, are relatively big actors. Like Frank Grillo or Grillo or whatever his name is, is a B movie actor. He tends to pop up in action flicks, and yeah. you know that's that's where he belongs. But Naomi Watts and Michelle Yeoh, like, what are they doing there? They've been nominated for stuff. <laughs> like they're up there. And the old uh, anti-Semite Mel Gibson, he's pretty ah, well, big. He can go fuck himself now. He can take what, he, <laughs> he can take what he's given, Michael. He yeah, can take what take, he's given. Take what you get, Mel. 
you, you, <laughs> you get what you get. You don't get upset. You don't get um, your own grave, yell racist. So yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't make any sense, Ben, because yeah. this lady who he's fighting is obviously an absolute master swordswoman. Right. And he learns to beat her in about maybe five loops. Uh, I call bullshit. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Like, um, he he goes to Michelle Yo, and in the first one, he's like, I'm a complete beginner, teach me. And in the next loop, it's like, I've had some training, teach me. And in the next loop, he says, I've learned a lot, but I need to learn more. And it would be fine if it took the Groundhog Day approach to a time loop. I'm talking about this more as a review of a time loop than a review of a film. Yeah, but that's fine, because it's it, billed as a time loop film, Michael. Yeah, but so it would be fine if it took a Groundhog Day attitude to time loops, Ben, and implied that maybe he'd done thousands of days of training with Michelle Yeoh. Couple of reps. But it doesn't. It keeps counting the loops. So we know that he spent about 12 hours training with Michelle Yeoh, and you are not going to beat a master swordsman with 12, 12 hours. hours of training. Nah. Just put a grenade or something where you know she's going to stand. And job. Yeah, it's so there's lots of things like that. It's not a great time loop film, unfortunately. So, so Michael, come here to me. If 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 I could I pitch a little, if I could pitch a little, Michael has told me what the film's about. Now I think I have a grasp on how I could make it a tiny bit better. Yeah. Um, if we had a non-experienced action da, right? Yeah. If we had just a regular old nerdy nerd. Yeah. Because you know. He married a nuclear physicist. Maybe she met another nuclear physicist, or maybe she met an astrophysicist, or maybe she met a philosophy professor. She yeah. fancy the pants off. Michael, yeah. then I think that'd be a more entertaining film if we saw him slowly learn to cope with a bunch of manic mercenaries that he just didn't take credulously and was like, this only happens in films. I think I'd watch that more. I think it would be better, Ben. Also, it would be better from a time loop perspective if thousands or hundreds of thousands of loops happened. Like yeah. is implied in Groundhog Day. Isn't it implied that he was there for 10,000 years or something? Oh, it's Groundhog something Day? ridiculous. He becomes practically a god of that town. It's a, yeah. it's a whole thing. And someone's whereas, done the math on that. It exists. Whereas this guy, I think he does probably 200 loops. It's, it's not, not enough, enough loops, Michael. It's not enough loops with that many variables. And with that in mind, Michael, we'd like to introduce our brand new standard for time loop films, Minimum Loop! Yeah, it does and not it's... achieve minimum loop. <laughs> it's 10,000 loops minimum. Minimum. For it to be a credulous film. <laughs> Have you ever read the book 10,000 Hours, Ben? <laughs> By Malcolm Gladwell, Michael. Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit pseudoscience-y, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not a bad start for this kind of film to... The lady with the sword, she has done at least 10,000 hours of sword Yeah, she's fighting. got minimum loop status. And she has killed hundreds of people, it's implied, with her sword. Yep. And bloody, there you go, there's Frankie Grills going in and learning 12 hours to beat her. And Job. He, he beats her as if he knows what she's going to do, which would have been a fine way to handle it. He wouldn't need any sword training if he just no. kept doing it just do a until he knew step. what to do. And, uh... So make up your mind, film. <laughs> But they wanted Make a cool training scene with Michelle Yeoh because she owed somebody a favour. And that is literally the only thing she does. <laughs> it. I think she has three lines. Oh, what a waste of Michelle Yeoh. Yeah, that's what this episode is called. A waste of Michelle Yeoh. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll write that yeah. down. So it's fine. It's okay. It's one of the weaker um, time loopy films, to be honest with you. It doesn't... <laughs> this is a weird thing to say. But it doesn't respect the time loop mechanics as much as I want, Ben. Michael, we should just rebrand this as a time loop podcast because yeah, that was an excellent breakdown. Of but Ben, it does have some inventive kills and it's, it is kind of fun. When it's when it's being inventive, it is kind of fun, but you could just watch the trailer, to be honest. Okay, so I'll just watch that on a loop. Yeah, it's uttered. Yeah, very good. Mm. Very amusing. Yes. Very, very amusing. Yes, I got you there. <laughs> very good. Um, You've made me laugh, but only inside, but a good hearty laugh inside. A good hearty laugh inside is what we can expect from uh, pandemic exhaustion, Michael. So I'll take it. Yes, I'll Benjamin. Take it. Yes. Um, speaking of Go on. being stuck in a never-ending time loop, <laughs> imagine watching something that was four hours long. <laughs> yeah, that came out almost five years ago now, Michael. <laughs> yeah, crazy, crazy mad shit. Crazy mad shit. Um, so, Michael, of course, we were saved. The, the pop culture world, Michael, was delivered. 
Um, yes. From the hell it's been living in, the Schneiderless hell it's mm-hmm. been living in for the last four, four to five years, um, by by the coming of and yes, cue Jesus. the very strange cover of Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen, the Schneider Cut. Hallelujah. That wasn't it. Huh? That wasn't it. It's in at the end. Is it? Oh, it is. Oh, it is, Michael. Is it in the credits? Oh, it's in the credits, Michael. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> Go have a look at that. Ben, Ben, I watched it for four hours and two minutes. I didn't watch the credits. <laughs> <laughs> I had a bloody... I, had no, I a can't midnight. believe you've watched the full four hours, Michael. I've skimmed the fucking thing. I wasn't giving ah, four hours. Ah, classic Ben. Ben, I have a little quote here from you um, oh, from balls. a few weeks ago. Oh, God. And this, this quote is uh, in relation to a film which is coming out which I said, I'm not going to watch that. That sounds like nonsense. I believe <laughs> it was some sort of Disney princess film. Probably Raya. Ray, that's what it was, exactly, yes. <laughs> and I have a quote here from one Benjamin J. Colby. Would you like me to read it out? What you have out there. It says, God. Mick, I think you'll find you co-host a pop culture podcast <laughs> and you are contractually obliged to watch this film. <laughs> so, Benjamin, I would just like to throw that back in your face. In relation to the four-hour opus, the Snyder Cut. Um, yeah, I, I waited up, Michael, and I applied the sunken cost fallacy, and I was like, "No, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not taking any of that on." Um, yeah, look, Michael, let's get into it, right? Um, right, go on. I, I think it's fair to say that Joss Whedon attempted to lighten it all up and have a little bit of an Avengers approach to his version of the Justice League, and we got lots of jokes like, "Do you bleed?" And Do then he's bleed. like, "Oh, something's bleeding." Yeah, and we got uh, a weird kind of schlubby Batman on the ground. Oh, oh, I've landed on this woman's boobies and I've never seen a woman before, so I'm very embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Ezra Miller. Um, uh, I, don't, that, I don't think he's a great egg either, Ben. No, he chokeholded a fan in Germany at one point. Yeah, it was, it was a person in Iceland, but... Oh, was it in Iceland? It was in Iceland. I imagine it wasn't a fan. (laughs) Probably someone who said, I fucking hate it, Justice League. You had (laughs) no character development. Yeah. So, uh, for some reason, Michael, Zack Schneider decided to lean into the thing that he's famous for, which is drama. Just lots of it. Um, And he just made it more serious, Michael. (laughs) Well, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut across you there, Ben. Go on. Because he didn't make it more serious. He made it this way originally. Oh, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. He made it this way originally, and the Joss Whedon version we saw was, having now seen the Justice League, the Zack Snyder version, the, the version we saw in cinemas was someone at Warner Brothers telling Joss Whedon, look at this mess. Will you please turn this into a film? <laughs> Could you cobble that together into yeah. something passable, please? Snyder has made another bloody mini series on a three hundred and sixty million dollar budget. Can you please turn this into something that we could realistically release in cinemas? And Joss Whedon said, "Oh, well, I'm not sure. I've got some bullying women to do before lunch, but then I might be able to squeeze a bit of time in later." Well, there's a there's a noted black actor that you can bully if you want, Joss. And I'm like, Great. Oh. Okay. Great. Yeah, I can move great. that around, so I'll move yeah, that great. around. As long as there's someone for me to bully, I'll be happy <laughs> enough. Yeah, we actually have him as the central plot of this film. How about you just minimise this part completely? Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Now, Ben, that's a very interesting point because it brings the whole Ray Fisher thing into Sharp somewhat of a <laughs> yeah, somewhat of a new light. Because you could argue, it could be argued, Ben, that. Cyborg is barely in the the Whedon version of this film, and it could fair. be argued that he's the main character of the of the Josh of the Josh Snyder one. So to me, that's the biggest jump. Mm. Um, is that yes, it's very clearly framed around a very different character in both films. Yes, um, and if I was Ray Fisher and I had yes. filmed tons of <laughs> scenes that never made it into the one that was released in cinemas I might be a little bit uh, might be a little bit irked myself yeah 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 but on the other hand I can also see where potentially um, he has taken what was a commercial decision that directors have to make all day every day very personally yes that's Act- also actors get cut out of films all the time and roles are minimised Long into production, uh, all the bloody time. Who was it who famously went to see the Thin Red Line 
and realised that he wasn't in it. Was it Christian Bale? Uh, I think it was Christian Bale. I think you're right. I, c- I can't remember who it was, but I remember them being very upset going to a film and going, I thought I was in this. It, it was the same with um, Peter Serafinowicz um, in The Phantom Menace. Peter Serafinowicz is a noted English comedian and he provided the voice for Darth Maul. Yes. But nobody had told him until he went to the film that they cut all his dialogue. And he has about three lines in the film. So he went to this film and he ended up being uncredited. Uh, um, classic <laughs> Sarah Fender with... So he went he to the film and he told his friends, you know, oh, I'm, I'm in the new Star Wars film. Fucking wasn't. <laughs> yeah, barely. I didn't realise that until many years later that he was the voice. I assumed it was just Ray Park doing a growly voice. Benjamin. So yeah. it does put a whole new spin on the Ray Fisher thing because I would be pretty pissed off if I was the heart of a four hour action movie and I got reduced to an extra. Essentially, yes. Yeah, and you took the whole meat and two veg of my character development out. Also, <laughs> it's blindingly obvious in this how Ben Affleck was forced to come back for the, the Whedon version. Yeah. <laughs> and he came back tanned out of shape. Yeah. Um, not interested it's bizarre Ben the real question is is it a better film okay so there's uh, now speaking I don't think better either someone of them who's good, barely Michael. seen it I don't no, but I don't think either of them are good I, I don't think so I've, I've watched a lot of the action sequences I've watched a lot of the the additional footage you know Alfred and Ray Fisher and, and all these things and I've, I've taken a, a serious look at all the changes none of those changes Michael yes make it a much better film right I actually disagree with you Ben and okay it's not it's not it's not common that I will say that one person's opinion is categorically superior to another, but I will in this case, as okay. you haven't seen it. Yeah, no, that's fair. <laughs> because if you're if you're only skimming the action scenes, the action scenes are mostly unchanged, except extended. It, extended, but mostly yeah, unchanged. Mostly the fight, unchanged. the fight fair. with conf- the co- the fight with confused Superman is bra- basically identical. Um, the attack on what you may call them, uh, uh fortress on Steppenwolf's fortress mostly yeah. the same um, the attack Steppenwolf attacking the Amazons broadly similar mm-hmm. but yeah the action scenes are mostly the same a lot more violent obviously yeah. but it's not that that makes the improvement what makes the improvement is this film has motivations and reasons that, and explanations yeah, okay. so Steppenwolf for example much better is much better. Mm. First of all, he looks a lot better. Thank God. But he's now also a snivelling, um, slightly cowardly... Bootlicker. Bootlicker. And mm. it makes a lot more sense why he's there. He's trying to make up to Darkseid and he, he... He's just more... He makes more sense. We know how he found out that the boxes were there. We know how he found out that the boxes were in Atlantis. We know why Aquaman went to Atlantis and happened to stumble across him. We know how Diana found out that uh, the Amazons had been attacked. We know why Diana knows so much about what's going on now, but she's never done anything about it in the past. We know why he was defeated in the past so easily. It all... Big bloody axe. A big axe from Ares, from David (laughs) Julius. And then he wasn't there to help when he's going to come back because Diana killed him. So, anyway, look, he did turn evil, so he probably deserved it. So, the motivations make much more sense. Batman going to meet Aquaman, even, makes more sense now. Because he goes to meet Aquaman during a storm, so he can't fly. But also, it's before he knows about Steppenwolf, so he's not in a hurry. Yeah. So, in the the Joss Whedon version, that didn't make any sense. If he was so desperate to... Like form a team because something was coming. Why did he trek across the mountains of Iceland instead of taking the bat plane? The old bat plane, Rooney. Yeah, so it it makes much, much, much more sense. There's also some weird contradictions in it. Like for some reason, all the Atlanteans are are English. Mer- Mira is English. Yeah, it was so weird. Yeah. After seeing two whole films with her speaking an American accent, you're like, oh, she's English now. Uh, the other thing is they were going to have clearly they weren't going to have Atlanteans speaking underwater 
because every time the Atlanteans speak, they open an air bubble. Oh. And then that's completely done away with in the Aquaman film and everyone's just chit-chatting to each other under the sea. Just having an atter. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, but, you know, it's a, it's a much better film. It is a much, much, much co- more coherent, more reason. It, it's oh, it's just a much better experience, Ben. But is it a good film? Mm. It's four hours. Four hours. It's is four it a hours. film? hours. It's four is it a hours. Film? Is it even a film? It's four hours. And it could probably be three hours if you sped up the, the slow motion scenes. <laughs> and it could probably be two and a half hours if you took out all the singing. And it could probably be, you know, it's... there. There's, there's, there's more... Someone, Ben, some genius, or someone with Adobe Home Premiere Pro... Me. Yes, for example, could take this film, take the Snyder Cut, um, apply the lessons learned by how it's better than the Whedon Cut. Okay. And cut this down to two and a half hours. Oh, nice, ha- Michael. And still have... And I think then you have the crystallization of the best... Not the perfect Justice League film, Ben. Because it's still a film which is trying to be... An Aquaman introduction, a Flash introduction, a Cyborg introduction, a Wonder Woman reintroduction, all at the same time. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much, Ben. But you could crystallize it down. Someone with a little bit more, someone with a little bit less, a high opinion of themselves than Zack, <laughs> might be able to cut out a lot of that material. Michael, I'm and- perfect. And get I hate it down myself. to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you didn't make it, Ben. It, ah, it doesn't it's... matter, Michael. Zach... Um, the objectivity. Think of the objectivity, Michael. The objectivity, that gives me... Ben. But it could be crystallized down into a two and a half hour, the best version of this story that you could get. So, for example, Ben, get rid of every scene with Martian Manhunter. Absolute what was that about? fucking nonsense. What was that nonsense, about? Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Like post hoc. Nonsense. So eager to get the full Justice League in there somewhere. <laughs> Nonsense. If you Why wanted... is he General Branwick? Well, he was always kind of implied that he was General Branwick, but... Oh, was his name? Okay. Yeah. I... Well, only off screen. Okay, I never picked up on that. No, but only off screen. It doesn't happen in the films that it was implied that it's him. Okay. But that scene with Lois and Martha. Bizarre. Where Martha convinces Lois to, you know, live her life. That was clearly written as Martha, not Martian Manhunter manipulating Lois. And then that dumbass scene of her walking outside the apartment for absolutely no reason whatsoever, changing into Martian Manhunter, posing for three minutes, then changing back into the general and leaving. Absolute flippin' nonsense. Get rid of it. (laughs) Cut it out. Get rid of it completely. That final scene where Martian Manhunter comes down and goes, I want to be on the Justice League. And Batman says... Yeah, all right. And he goes, okay then, uh, I'll head off, but I'll be back when there's some justice to get fucking out of here, Martian Manhunter. What do you think of Jared Leto? Get rid of him. (laughs) Completely (laughs) unnecessary. Unnecessary. Of Jared Leto. Uh, And also the scene in that movie. Uh, Yeah, get rid of actor Jared Leto and get rid of that entire scene. What a waste of time. After introducing, yeah, I know. <laughs> After <laughs> introducing obvious. Deathstroke in the previous, ridiculous, se- literally the previous scene is Deathstroke setting himself up to be a, a terrible enemy for Batman, and then the next scene he's in the Justice League. Nonsense, post hoc nonsense. Get rid of it. Get it out of there. Cut it down to two. Cut out the Icelandic women singing. Get it down to two hours, two and a half hours, and you have the best film you can make out of this mess. Right, so as punishment for me not watching the full four-hour cut now, I will now be making the Schneider cut, Sean Rebug cut. Um, yes. On Premiere Pro, at home, objectively speaking. Very uh, good. Trying to make a passing film out of a four-hour miniseries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take out the take out the Martian Manhunter stuff. There you go. <laughs> take out the Martian Manhunter stuff. Take out that stupid flash-forward scene. You're halfway there. The flash-forward scene. Like, ah, so much stuff crammed in, Michael. Fan service, Ben. That was fan service. Yeah. 
And yeah. the post, like, this is very much not the film that Snyder would have released if he had released it four, four years ago. No way! It's not a chance, because this film has the four years of fan expectations, which we've been talking about a lot recently. Imagine yes. if imagine if they re-released WandaVision, Ben, in five years, but in the end, it turned out that the rabbit was Mephisto. <laughs> it was but Mephisto! He, it was Mephisto, Ben. And the rabbit never interacts with anyone as Mephisto. It just, there's one scene where the rabbit turns into Mephisto and goes, <laughs> I'm Mephisto, and then turns back into the rabbit, and then the plot continues. That is the equivalent of the Martian Manhunter scenes. Pure bullshit. <laughs> excellent but I'd look it's a, it's a much better film Ben I start watching it at half past ten at night and I said I'll watch half of it and then watch the second half in the morning and I watch the whole thing through in one sitting and it is quite enjoyable to do that with good it's, man yeah 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 it's much better it's much 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 better is it good nearly nearly <laughs> it's nearly good those That's things that we've been c- complaining about take you out of it so much but it's nearly good Nearly good. Okay. Well, you know, sometimes nearly good is all you get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of nearly good, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, go say it. Finish that segue. That was very really good, Ben. Have you seen the Falcon and the Winter Soldier? <laughs> Uh, Michael, one of the best segues you've ever had on this show. Michael, <clears throat> you and I are in a, a group with one Stephen Cadwell. Yes. And uh, we got a text last night, quite quite late in the evening, that just said the timidity. The timidity, Ben. Which you'll, which which um, people who are a fan of lexophiles, I suppose, Michael, will know is the exact opposite of the audacity. Exactly, Ben. Um, what, what we got, Michael, with episode one of the <laughs> the Falcon and Winter Soldier, is is to call it a slow burn is an insult to slow burns, Michael. It's well, oh, Michael. Well, what, what a strange opener. It, it don't forget, Ben. It was nearly an hour. Yeah, I know, and but still. <laughs> it spunks its load of action in the first 15 minutes and then has 30 minutes of uh, of uh, relationship-building drama. But it does have a very, very good and very expensive opening sequence. Yeah, no, that's good. Batrock the Leaper is back, Michael. <laughs> Batrock the Leaper, Joe Chapierre, and he is back. Je suis de France, he says. Yeah, and you give him a little kick. Oh, and he does a, a kick, kick and a high kick and a jump. Well... Michael, one of the greatest insults, I think, to to Falcon's special armoured thrusting wings yeah. is that a couple of wingsuits could outrun him for quite a bit. What is this, Ben? T- bloody 2011? <laughs> <laughs> bloody wingsuits, wingsuits are back? Are bullshit, Michael. Yeah. I was like, hang on, hang on. He's got high-grade aerodynamic thrusted wings. Catch them! <laughs> They're Stark Tech. He's got this in two minutes or less. Yeah. Who thought, like, who was looking at that going, yeah, yeah, no, it's grand. Uh, we'll outrun, we'll outrun the Falcon well, in wingsuits. There you go, Ben. That wasn't their plan. They had no reason to believe the Falcon was going to intervene. Oh, I suppose that's true, Michael. So, you know, they weren't bringing wingsuits to a jetpack fight, as the saying goes. Um, but they did do a very good job of evading for that long with the wingsuits. On the way, Ben. To stopping Godzilla, which they had to do before they popped off into Chicago to fight Megatron. Ah, uh, look, it's a classic, Michael. Classic wingsuits. You can't beat wingsuits, Ben. We should do an episode about wingsuit films. Yeah. Yeah, we should do... Oh, we should, actually. I'm going to write that down. That'd be great. You write that down, Ben. Oh, wingsuit out, films. oh no. Do you know what we should do, Michael? Outdated extreme sports scenes in films. <laughs> yeah. That's no, exactly Falcon, what we'll do that. I on. hope Falcon surfs in the next one. <laughs> like a... Uh, on a... Stark tech board and yeah, still yeah. can't out surf regular boards. Yeah. Um, and goes, yeah, when he lands. Um, anyway, Ben. So, yeah, on. it has a great action scene. I watched this with my good lady friend, Ben. Yes. And I could tell it was a good action scene because she kept fidgeting and jidgeting and going, Oh, oh Falcon, be careful. Oh. That's, <laughs> so, that's how you know. You know, she wouldn't do that during Justice League, for example. Nah, it's all slow motion, Michael. You can tell the moves a yeah. mile away. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it was a good action. It was a very expensive looking action scene. But it was... A lot of booms. A lot of booms. A lot of boom. Also, like... A lot of... Very old-fashioned. Canyon fight. Hold on a second, Ben. Sorry sorry to interrupt the podcast. I've got a a phone call coming in here. Okay. Hello? Yeah? Ben, it's 1996's Independence Day. They want their uh, canyon fight back. 
okay. Tell him I said hi. I've already got them. Yeah, look, that opening scene is great. One of my favorite scenes in it, Michael, is where Winter Soldier makes a reappearance. Yes. Um, in full Winter Soldier mode. And we get a little Hail Hydra. And I was gutted, Michael. I yes. was gutted when yes. Bucky woke up and it was all a dream. I was rather hoping, Michael, oh, that he was back. the Winter Soldier was out there checking names off his list, writing some wrongs. Yeah. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. No, no, he's not. He's Bucky's writing wrongs. He's doing a My Name is Earl. Yes, my name is... Oh, my God, Michael, that's exactly what it is. The plot of The Wild, The Falcon, and Winter Soldier is My Name yeah. is Earl. It's, it's just My Name is Earl, the action oh, film. My, you're a genius. That's all it is. That's all it is, Ben. <laughs> my name is James Bucky Buchanan, yeah. and you've helped me right or wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, Ben. Um, and I think he might be a Scientologist as well. So, <laughs> oh. double points. Um, I liked it, though. I thought it was big budget. It was... Well written, well performed, well acted, and it was very much what what it was. Ben, let's be honest, was hey, calm your calm your pants down. I know you all enjoyed One Division. It was very good, very experimental. Everything was very exciting, and this is a bit more run of the mill. So here's a big expensive action sequence for you. Now you enjoy that. Watch out for this Sam Wilson fella. He'll kill you as soon as look at you. He has no qualms about killing a man, Ben. And he shouldn't. He's a soldier. Yeah, well, Ben, not all soldiers are merciless killing machines. No, no, no. But in the context of what he does, Michael, it you know, yeah, he, he I, I no suppose his, his killing, Michael, is done in the fashion of in the situation killing, where to to imply to to employ a rigorous heroic code might actually obstruct getting the target. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I saw what you're saying, but then he does do some inventive and fun kills. Those are good, aren't they? The bit with the, the little grappling hook, he pulls <laughs> he him straight out of the thing. that man to death. Just oh. threw him out of a helicopter. Yeah, the poor man probably had a family. I mean, anyway, Batrock will be back, so I'm looking forward yeah, to that. Yeah, Batrock will it. definitely be back. He'll be like, "Oh, je suis Batrock, je suis de France, je suis uh, de Quebec, un kick, un kick, uh, avec uh, un punch." <laughs> That's what we'll get. Um, no, I, in fairness, Michael, I, I was being very unfair there. It is well written. And Anthony Mackie can act. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, Anthony Mackie's a famous actor, Ben. Yeah, but I didn't know he could act properly, Michael. <laughs> He's not actually Sam Wilson the Falcon, Ben. He's Anthony Mackie. He's a Hollywood actor. I, I, I didn't know Anthony Mackie could act. Yeah, he's very good. Anthony bloody Mackty, huh? Huh? Oh, very good, because he's always acting, I get it. He's always acting. Um, yeah. yeah, no, look, there's some interesting scenes there. I think I like the blip consequences that are being dealt with. Yes, a kind of rolling back on um, both shows, actually, between WandaVision and this. They're showing the blip as a much bigger thing than Spider-Man Far From Home did. Yes, it's affecting Where everything, Michael. Everyone unblipped and then just went back on school trips. Uh, yeah, no, that, that doesn't happen here, Michael. I mean, I think one of the one of the most telling world-building moments or, you know, world is having moments is the bank denial. Mm, good Where scene. You know, um, Sam Wilson is, c like, convinced that oh, I'm the Falcon and uh, also I know this works under this scheme. And the bank is like, oh, yeah, we didn't want enough people uh, putting in for that, so we screwed them. And I was like, oh, yeah, very yeah. accurate. Very accurate yeah, yeah. to how so, policies yeah, would it's, change. It's about it's about money and also maybe racism, but keep that under your oh, hat. Michael, I think keep, there's, uh, there's going to be quite a bit of racism there, Michael. So Keep uh, that under the old hat there. The, the big reveal that we saw in every trailer um, is that it, we have the, the US agent has been introduced at the end of um, Winter Soldier and the Falcon. And it's a great way to bookend it because the opening scene is is Sam donating the shield. Yeah, he's giving it up and he's like, I don't want to be Captain America. Um, and he thinks it's being donated to, to hang in a museum. Mm. And Nothing. then we find out at the end, no, it's actually a weird senator who wants his own little... His own little Captain America, government-sanctioned Captain America again. That's mm. what he wants. Um, do you th do you think he's going to have superpowers, Ben? Um, I think he. Do you know what? I uh, that's a tough one because in the comics he does. Yes, um, very much so. More than Captain America. Yeah, uh, more than Captain America. Yeah, because bearing in mind, Ben, comic book Captain America isn't really superpowered. Okay. Comic book Super uh, Captain America is like peak human performance in everything, which is a superpower, obviously. Yeah. But he can lift what like an Olympic lifter of his size could lift. Fair. And he can sprint what an Olympic sprinter of his 
size could sprint. sprint. Like he's the absolute best you can do without going into superhuman. Okay. And that is very much not what MCU Captain America is. MCU Captain America is definitely superhumanly strong and True. superhumanly fast. So the MCU Captain America that we've had over the last 10 years kind of has the power set of... Uh. What you may call him from the comics? What's his US name? Again? Agent. Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker. <laughs> Johnny Walker. That's actually his name. Yes. Yeah. Um, so John Walker is is introduced to us here. Um, I I think it has fascinating implications. I think it's a very strong move for an MCU film because if he's anything like the comic book um, character Michael, he's used to kind of shine a, a light on a lot of the the overzealous patriotism and the diehard patriotism that we see in certain aspects of American culture. Mm, um, especially with the Flag Smashers involved, Ben. I mean, there's a lot going on there. Flag Smashers who want, uh, you know, a return to, to pre-blip times. I, I don't know. I, I don't get the connection between wanting to go back to the blip and also wanting to get rid of countries. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. Maybe they feel in a time of crisis, you can you can get rid of borders. I don't know. Um, yeah. They're like doctors without borders, but pricks. But pricks. Yeah. Um, so there's a little bit of flag smashers there, but I think, or well, I think in response to the the new world order, I suppose it's an immigration parallel, Michael. In terms of this this US agent could be kind of an ice, mm. um, with very very excessive tactics and and some some grim choices. I think. Uh, we're going to see a very McCarthyism style politician in that man who's created this new super soldier. Um, and I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see that play out. There's going to be a, a kind of a, a dark side of the government that wants a very rigorous and America for the Americans. I don't know. I think there's, it's going to be. There's a very interesting parallel, Ben, and I know I do this nearly every episode, but there's a very interesting parallel to season five of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh, for fuck's sake. Where in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. the government introduced Patriot. And Patriot was introduced as a kind of Captain America style character. He was played by an Irish actor whose name I've forgotten. But you know him. You know the guy. The Irish guy from Captain Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, that guy. I've forgotten his name. God damn it. Emmett Scanlon. No, but he is introduced as like a Captain America style US government inhuman. An all-American boy. Yeah, he's an inhuman to not be afraid of. He's like, he's an all-American boy and he's here for truth and value and justice and he's on our side. And he turns out to be a fake. He turns out that he's getting like very short dosages of superpowers only for like showing off. But he's yeah. no use in an actual crisis. He can't, oh, no. He can't do anything. So, you know, it wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if it goes that way as well. Oh, you, that's it. That's a, an MCU classic, Michael, isn't it? Introduce one of the big bads and then be like, "Oh well, actually, oh, it's the Trevor effect." Very good, Ben. That's a very good segue. It, it was. It was good, wasn't it? Um, yes. So, Michael, this week, um, because I, I'm actually quite excited to see the return of Baron Zemo in uh, Winter Soldier and the Falcon. I love the way that character was treated um, in Civil War, and he kind ben. of got. Yeah, go ben. on. Can I just point out that you haven't once said the name of the show correctly? Well, okay, go on. <laughs> that no, you. Do, what What do you think it's called? Falcon just and the Winter briefly. Soldier? It, they're two thes. Falcon and Winter Soldier, that's what I'm no, calling it's, from No, it's The Falcon and The Winter Soldier. No, it doesn't Falcon matter, and Winter Soldier. Ben. It doesn't matter. I just find it amusing that not only have you not got it right, you also haven't got it wrong the same way twice. <laughs> Salmon book. That's what I'm calling it. Now <laughs> Captain America's friends. <laughs> <laughs> a trio without one. Um, yeah. So look, no. Sharon gonna... Carter's going to be there, Ben. So she'll be the third. Oh, is she? Yeah, Captain America's buddies. It should have been called. <laughs> <laughs> that awkward moment when the friend that you all know leaves the room and you have to get on. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh. oh. oh Steve's a bit of a prick. Way, and then we all remember that time you left me that. at the cinema with your brother, and I was like, "Oh, so <laughs> how do you know, Ben?" <laughs> that actually happened. <laughs> um, that's true. Sorry, anyway, what were you saying? So anyway... Baron Zemo. Uh, Baron Zemo used to be a big purple-clad, sword-wielding kind of maniac, Michael, in the old comic books. Um, and he's a real zealous kind of Nazi, and it was real interesting. And then they've, they they toned that down and gave a very subtle version of Baron Zemo as kind of a calculated master planner. Yeah, very nuanced, in very Civil interesting. War. And I enjoyed that immensely, Michael, and I'm looking forward to see him return 
uh, to seeing him return in in uh, Sam and Buck, and and it was of course played by Daniel Brühl in my second favorite Daniel Brühl role, outside of Nicky Lauda. <laughs> he was Nicky Lauda in the film Rush. It was great. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that return. But Michael, it got me thinking: what other uh, old villains from the Marvel universe need a need an old new coat of paint, Michael? What who could do with the sprucing up? Um, so I put it out to the the listeners, Michael. I've heard of them. Uh, yeah, they're great, great bunch of lads, and we got quite a few uh, responses there. So one of the ones that we got from a uh, fan of the podcast, Sean, is yes. uh, he'd love to see the Mandarin done right um, in the new Shang Chi film. I think he might be in for a bit of a treat, Ben, because they probably will. Oh, they probably will, Michael. Unless Michael, they pull the ballsiest of moves and get Ben Kingsley back. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if they had, if they did the Mandarin as the Chinese stereo, the gross Chinese stereotype? Shang Chi finally defeats him, and then you hear, "You weren't ready for me." And Ben yeah. Kingsley comes out and goes, "Trevor was just a character I created to cover my real ambitions." <laughs> nice. I'd watch the hell out of that. <laughs> I'd watch the hell out of that. People a, would burn their copies of Iron Man three. A slightly, a slightly camp version of a London stage actor being like, "Oh no, I'm just having a wonderful time. It's a role of a lifetime." Um, Trevor. I merely adopted that persona to avoid capture. Oh, it's Tom Hardy in a mask. That's well, what that's, the Mandarin uh, really is. That's what the Mandarin did. That was his voice, wasn't it, roughly, from the original no, you have Iron it. Man trailer? You, you have it. You're Some absolutely correct. Some people call me a terrorist. A terrorist. I prefer <laughs> teacher. I'm an English person doing an American accent. Look, that's all the MCU really is, Michael. That's all it is. That's all it is now Put these days. Do an accent. Um, so, yeah, that that was one of the options that we got. Then we got a great suggestion um, Go from Stephen Cadwell, who we've already had featured on this very episode, Michael. Um, and that was Galactus done right, but as a cosmic horror, kind of a mm. an eldritch boy. I would love, Michael, yes. to see... That, that got me thinking. I would love to see... Uh, an almost magic-based Galactus or horror-based Galactus go up against the scientific Fantastic Four. That would be interesting. I'd like to see a magic versus science where Reed Richards has excelled in all manners of science. And I'd love to watch a film where he kind of trounces... I, I guess it'd be a second film in a series or a third film in a series, Michael, because you'd have to do mm -hmm. a bit of building first, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah do yeah. the whole thing. But I'd like to see him... Kind of, by film two, he's really nailed the science game. Do you know what I mean? He mm. he can open portals to different places. He's he's solved a lot of problems with the blip, maybe. Um, yes. Science villains keep trying to, you know, take him out and stuff like that. But he's filled the vacuum that Tony Stark left behind. He has the Baxter mm -hmm. building in full flow. Um, he kind of, he's the new Tony Stark. And he's doing great. The team is doing great. Everybody's doing great. And then, Michael, all of a sudden, New Yorkers and people around the globe are, are hearing voices. But it's all the same voice, Michael. And it's very strange. And it started a brand new cult. And Reed, you know, kind of postulates all kinds of different ideas. And he's like, oh, well, look, it's just, you know, a mass delirium or it's a mass hysteria or, you know, whatever you like, Michael. It's the Scarlet Witch again. She's it's the Scarlet messing. Witch again. She made a comeback and we just need to deal with that. Um, and I like the idea, Michael, of this this force that Reed Richards can't understand um, mm. manipulating the world around him. And he kind of gets, gets brought down a peg or two. I'd also love to see a big spooky Galactus. I'd still yeah. like to see a big full-bodied Galactus. I don't want a cloud. You know, yeah, I'd, I would like him to be... <laughs> the Rise of the Silver Surfer had some great ideas. Okay. And some of the apocalyptic... Uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Pre precedence? No. Uh, premonition. Some of the apocalyptic scenes in, in Rise of the Silver Surfer were quite spooky. I actually think the comic book Marvels does a great job of it. Of, if you remember, a slowly rising tension of things getting gradually yeah. weirder and no one being able to figure it out. Yeah. You could really do a really spooky Galactus. I still think he should be a, just a big spooky purple man. Oh, yeah. But... Don't try and Thanos him. Don't try and give him understandable, approachable human motivations. And a sizable chin. Be, 
yeah, <laughs> have him be an unknowable eldritch horror who's doing this for no reason that we will ever fathom. Even the whole I'm hungry and I need to eat your world thing. Don't say it. He doesn't don't need to say it. Yeah, don't let him say it. Bring Silver Surfer. That's where you interact with him. I, I'd like a weird reality warping Silver Surfer. I'd like you'd have... I, I would like to have a strange kind of... Still, again, someone that bends the rules of physics around Reed Richards and just causes him to be like, what the fuck am I supposed to do What's with this? What's going on? Yeah, I thought that was, you can't do that. That's breaking the rules. What do you mean? Like, How oh. do you travel faster than the speed of light? You can't travel faster than the speed of light. Just having the Silver Surfer travel faster than the speed of light, but not using wormholes or, or any of the other Marvel technology, just to do it. He can <laughs> just do it. He just walks like, through the board and the board reappears somewhere else as a kind of monolith and strolls out of that. I like I'm in I'm into it. Yeah, yeah. I, just do whatever he wants. And Reed Rich is like, this isn't science, this isn't fair, this is bullshit. I'm gonna figure it out. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like like there's a lot you could do with that, Michael. I, I like the idea of like monoliths or markers of Galactus being there and they're like big silver kind of metallic things. And those are the way that the silver surfer moves through the world. He can go in and out of bloody monoliths and stuff like that. Like big liquidy metal stuff. I always like that liquid metal effect in the the Rise of the Silver Surfer. I thought that was kind of the, cool. Rise of the Silver Surfer had some very good ideas. Yeah. It, it gets lost, but it, Silver Surfer was pretty cool in that until he loses power and became Matt Gray. And that was, was weird. Kinda, yeah, it was weird. But the initial Silver Surfer appearances were good and spooky and terrifying. Yeah, because he was a big, he was just overpowered creature that you had to kind of try and wrap your little human brain around. Um, we got some other suggestions, Michael. Uh, um, I love a suggestion, Ben. I love them. Yeah, they're they're wonderful, Michael. Um, Brian's Action Toy Re uh, Can you get the channel name right for me? Because I don't want to do him a disservice. It's Brian. I think it's Brian's Action Figure Reviews. Uh, Brian's Action Figures Review. No toy. Uh, Brian's Action Figures Reviews. Great channel. You should check it out. Um, gave us the shout and said Mojo. He'd love to see Mojo done. Now, Mojo's a mm. deep 90s cut from the X-Men, Michael. Mm. Um, Mojo would be hard to do in cinema, but uh, but Brian gave us the 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 seeds to do it. He could do it in a Wandavision style, in a bizarre world that doesn't make sense to our heroes. Now the only difference between doing Mojo right and doing everything else right is that we'd have to have established heroes go in in a situation that the, they don't recognize. So you would need a recognizable set of heroes mm -hmm. um, to do that with. Mojo in the comics, Michael is a kind of a. Re, uh, an alternate reality reality TV guy. Yeah, he's gross. And he likes pitting heroes against each other for entertainment. That's what he does. Um, you remember, Michael, one of my very early and completely wrong theories on WandaVision was that it might be arcade. Oh, gross. Um, but you could you could have an interesting kind of hybrid idea there and, and a strange situation that the heroes don't really understand, like a battle world or something like that. Um, obviously... I, I, a couple of years ago, Michael, I would have said that would be impossible. But fucking WandaVision. Bloody... Do whatever you want Sh Shang now, Chi's ben. getting a film. Do you know what Shang I mean? Chi? The Eternals are getting the, a film. The Eternals had a film in December... In January... In, 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 oh, God. November 2020, was it? Yeah. Is that when it was well, supposed to come out? We'll get it eventually, Michael. We'll get it eventually. Bloody hell. Um, but, like, I mean, that's, that's interesting stuff. Do you know what I mean? That's... Uh, you you could theoretically take villains that have been forgotten about in the MCU and, and give them a little sprucing. One that I would love to see personally, Michael, is Bullseye. Um, I'm I'm Go mad on. for Bullseye, Michael. Ever since the Frank Miller run on Daredevil, um, I used to get it in the you know the collector's editions you'd buy in Eason. Yeah, very good Eason's. Yeah, yeah. Is it Eason's or Eason? <laughs> it's Eason. Ben, usually the joke is I say Eason and you say Eason. Oh, sorry. So you've said Eason. So I had to do the opposite then. Would you like me to go back? No, nah, it's again? fine. It's fine. No, okay. Benjamin. Yeah. But didn't you already get two adaptations of Bullseye? Well, we've had, we've had the, we've had the, the what's, Farrell, call him? Right? what's his name? Yeah, Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell, the Farrell. I Give never missed. The devil made me miss. Have mercy. And then we saw the, the Daredevil Bullseye. Yeah, the kind of and, nascent proto bullseye. Yeah, it was a bit, you know, but that never came to full fruition for me, Michael. I'd like to see bullseye as a constant thorn in the side of maybe Salmon Book season two. Oh, you know, very good. Um, I think he'd be an excellent kind of thing. I'd like to see him with that subtle kind of thing. I'd like the irritating thing about him to be is that he actually never misses, and it's very hard to foil him. He does it very subtly. 
Like, I don't want him throwing, you know, I don't want him shooting his gun at you. I don't want him throwing, like, big feck off knives at you. I want him to do subtle little things where he nicks, like, your carotid artery with a paper clip or something like that. Because That's he's what the Farrelor does. I know, but I'd like to see that, Michael. I, I would like the menace of a man who picks up anything to be mm. a pain in the ass. I, I would really, really like it where you had a scene where Sam and Buck are like, don't let him get his hands on anything. And then it's too late. Once he has his hands on something, you know, the target dies or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Because Sam and Buck, let's face it, Michael, they'll be yeah. fine. Sam will chuck they're up the, the, the big arm. The shield. Or, yeah. Sorry, the, Sam will chuck up the wings and Buck will chuck up the arm and they'll be fine. They'll, they'll be, fine. be fine. But if they have to protect the target or if they have to stop somebody being assassinated and you're looking for the man who's carrying a weapon, but nobody needs to carry a weapon, Michael. You might just have a sharpened two euro coin in your pocket. Yeah, he'll kill you with the button off his sleeve. I mean, what a, what a, what a great moment of tension. Maybe not forever, Michael. Maybe it's just a bat rock. Maybe he just pops up every once in a while. <laughs> you know, ah, I'm Colin Farrell. I'm ah, I'm Colin Farrell. Actually. I mean, get Colin Farrell back, Michael. Let him redeem himself. <laughs> yeah. I'd actually like to see Punisher in Falcon and Winter Soldier that, I know I've talked about this before but I would love to see it I I thought that's exactly what we were getting Michael when I saw the Winter Soldier flashback I was like oh Bucky's gone full Punisher mm. I thought that's what we were getting it wasn't Delicious. but I thought it was and the other one I'd love to see Michael because it's a, a villain that I've never understood why I'm fascinated by but it's Craven the Hunter Michael isn't he coming? I think no. he probably is he? is he? I don't know. They're always rumoring him, but there's so much going on with this. Sp there's so many Spider-Man rumors now. It's hard to tell what's what. I I think had it not been for the inevitable restructuring of the Black Panther franchise, I think he would have made a great Black Panther two villain. Mm, very um, good. I think uh, 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 maybe a South African, right? Um, and maybe he has somehow figured out the ritual that um, Black Panther does, but he is missing certain aspects of it so he becomes a more feral version of it or something like that I think that would have been very interesting Michael a demented kind of mildly racist let's do it let's lean into it you know what I mean no let's have that character get his come up get come Mel on. Gibson just get Mel Gibson get let's him in get there that. that's it that's it give Mel Gibson the goddamn role and you could have actually let Chadwick Boseman kick this shit out of him yeah. Mel Gibson would have been like where's my stunt double oh no Mel <laughs> there's no stunt doubles today oh, no. Melvin <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But I would have liked to see uh, a Craven that kind of makes a mockery of the Wakandan tradition. I think that would have been a really interesting. So it would have been the Wakandan ritual without the reverence or without the the history and the you know the importance of it. I, I think that would have been very interesting. Andy Circus would have been good for that. He would have been great for that. If Shame he hadn't already been that and been claw and been killed. Um, but yeah, I would have liked that, Michael. I would have, I would have watched the crap out of that. That would be very good. Benjamin, I would like to see Armin Zola come back in a big robot body. Oh, big old TV chest. Big old TV chest robot body. I hope yeah. that happens. In I hope that's the denouement of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Oh, it's been, I hope it's he comes been back and goes, long. Hello, I am Armin Zola and I am in this big robot body. But and I'm going to start as a German but finish the sentences as a Transylvanian. Yeah, it'd be well good. Michael, what yeah. I would love to see is he's he still hasn't managed to catch up with modern technology. So he communicates through bloody pixels or, <laughs> you know, an Put old TV. Put me on from... a flash drive. <laughs> <laughs> Sega Mega Drive, Armin Zola. Put me on the flash drive and transfer my consciousness into this robot body. Give me oh, a steak, please. I'd love that. I'd love that. It'd be very good. Benjamin, I'd love to see the abomination come back. Um, he is coming back, isn't he? I don't know. There's always rumours that he's coming back or he was coming back or where is was he? he What's he doing? Is he not supposed to come back in, in Salmon Book? Is he? Is he not supposed to come back? Is he? That would be a treat, wouldn't it? That'd be good, wouldn't it? Because he'd make sense. Like, if... Mm. Let's let's say, Michael, let's you and I... Okay. Let's you and I assume that the right. Flag Smashers need allies um, yeah. and they need some super-powered ones. Or maybe, Michael, they're just out to cause a little chaos. Yeah, because I think the scene that we got in episode one is is kind of a thing of uh, we commit crimes in chaos. That's what we do. Mm. Um, I mean, the abomination would be a great one to let out of his cage, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Mephisto. Or Mephisto or Jerry Seinfeld, Roxa. <laughs> what is the deal with unifying the world? <laughs> <I think> good. <laughs> Let's wrap it up. <laughs>
<laughs> That's it from us, ladies and gentlemen, for this week. Um, <clears throat> what heroes would you like to see? Who did we miss? You can get in touch with us a, in a bunch. Villains, of Ben. We were places. talking about villains. Sorry. Or if, yeah, okay. <laughs> Let me know. Let me stick with the actual topic I set out to do and say what yeah, villains yeah, yeah, would yeah. you like to see from the screen. Um, let us know in the following places. You can find us on the interwebs at www.shamrabyug.com. S e o m r a b e a g dot com. I mean, it's tiny room in Irish. If you don't like that, if it's a little bit old-fashioned, if it's a little bit 90s, you can find us on the old Instagram. At Shomer Bjog, S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G. Still means tiny room in Irish. Still means tiny room in Irish. I'm checking the calendar now, Michael, because I've forgotten to look at it again before the day. What are we talking about next week, Ben? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, next week, Michael, is going to bring us into the, the bloody, the 1st of April, Michael. Old April Foolies Day. Old April Foolies Day, which means we'll be taking a look, Michael, um, at tricksters and, and connivers and, and tiddlywinks. Very good, very exciting. Yeah, that's what we're going to be taking a look at. So you can get in touch with us and let us know those as well, the addresses that you've already had. Um, that's it for us, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye now. Bye. See you. Uh, the four hour cut is available to download on Podbean. <laughs>